Welcome back to our uh, second talk in this series on uh, Second Peter. And today's uh, talk is entitled Unembarrassed Supernaturalism, uh, Recovering Our Eschatology. And uh, we're going to begin by looking at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. So please have your Bibles open and uh, read along with me. I'm going to read the whole of chapter 3. Uh, but for the first of these three talks on chapter 3, I will look at verses 1 to 7. So please pray with me as we come to God's Word. Father, in your light uh, we see light, so we pray that you would come now and illuminate the reading and the preaching of your Word, that we might see Christ more clearly, uh, love Him more dearly, and follow Him more nearly. And we ask this uh, in His name, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever praised. Amen. So, Second Peter, chapter 3, and beginning at verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not Overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Like uh, many historical schools here in America, the school I went to in Belfast, Northern Ireland, had a motto in Latin, uh, Quereri Verum, 
Quaeri verum. My younger brother liked to say that it meant leave early. Uh, the fact that he was caught leaving early one day by the principal might have something to do with his rather creative translation of the Latin. Uh, but quaeri verum actually means seek the truth. Seek the truth. Uh, school mottos are helpful because they capture what the school is all about in just a few words. Now, if I was to try and capture what Second Peter is all about, I'd give it a short motto, not in Latin, you'll be pleased to hear, but in English, uh, with a wee bit of a Greek flavor. Uh, Second Peter can be captured in three words, ethics by eschatology, ethics by eschatology. I had thought of the motto, living with the end in mind, uh, but that's six words and therefore harder to remember. Okay, so three words, ethics by eschatology. There's a certain ring to it. It's memorable, just like an old school motto. Uh, now, I know we're all feeling the effects of the lockdown, so uh, a bit of Greek is not exactly the best way to start off the second talk in a series uh, over the internet. Uh, but where there's a will, there's a way. So, uh, let me unpack the meaning behind the words ethics and eschatology. Ethics comes from the Greek word etheke, meaning moral. Ethics is a set of morals by which we live. A set of morals by which we live. The second word, eschatology, it's a bit like biology or theology. It's formed from two words being stuck together. So eschatos means last, last things. Uh, logia, study of. So eschatology means the study of last things. Uh, eschatology is the study of the last things concerning Christ's return. It includes the return of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, the afterlife in heaven and hell, and the tail end of world history just before all those things occur. Uh, in short, eschatology is the study of how the world will end. It's the study of how the world will end. And that's what Second Peter is all about, ethics by eschatology. Ethics by eschatology. It's about how we live now in light of then. It's about how we live in the present in light of the future. Second Timothy is about living with the end in mind. It's about ethics by eschatology. Let me show you three places in uh, Peter's second epistle which highlights this connection between ethics and eschatology. If you glance back to chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see the connection between ethics and eschatology? Uh, verse 10 gives us the ethic. If you do these things, that is, if you practice the virtues listed in verses 5 to 7, there's the ethic. Verse 11 gives us the eschatology. We will be welcomed into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to make every effort to practice these things because if we do, then we will receive a rich welcome into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see it? Do you see the connection between ethics and eschatology? It's ethics by eschatology. It's about living now in light of then. Uh, the same connection is there in chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Uh, there's the eschatology. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And now, here's the ethics. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? You see it? Ethics by eschatology. The connection's there again in verses 13 and 14. Verse 13, But according to His promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's the eschatology. 
Therefore, verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot and at ble- or blemish and at peace. There's the ethics in light of the eschatology. Do you see it? Ethics by eschatology. We are to live now in light of then. And as we look at 2 Peter 3, uh, this is what we're going to see, ethics by eschatology. It's what the whole book is about. Uh, The connection is even there in our passage that I read earlier, uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Uh, The first letter It's obviously 1 Peter, a letter he wrote to Christians who were exiled in Asia Minor because of Emperor Nero's persecution. Uh, Peter most likely writes this second letter from prison around uh, 64, 68 AD to the same group of scattered Christians uh, that he wrote to in his first letter. And here in verses 1 and 2, he reminds us why he wrote um, to stir up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. The words spoken in the past by the holy prophets refer to the Old Testament prophecies of God coming in judgment at the end of the world through His Son, Jesus Christ. We saw that in our first talk, the return of Jesus Christ in power and glory. There's the eschatology. And the command in verse 2, given by the Lord Jesus through his apostles, is the moral imperative contained in the Christian message, the imperative to make every effort to live godly lives as we await the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's the ethics. So we have the predictions by the Old Testament prophets, verse 2, about God's coming judgment, eschatology, and we have the command by the New Testament apostles about how to live under, until God comes in judgment, there's the ethics. So we have at the beginning of chapter 3 this connection between ethics and eschatology. It's ethics by eschatology. We are to live now in light of then. And Peter reminds us uh, of this because verses 3 And four, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Do you see what the scoffers and false teachers do? They challenge our ethic by their lifestyle, they follow their own evil desires, and they challenge our eschatology by their skepticism. Where is his coming that he promised? And Peter doesn't want us to be led into their sinful lifestyle or to adopt their skeptical outlook. And so he writes this letter to stir up our minds to wholesome thinking. He wants us to be certain about our eschatology. God is coming in judgment at Jesus' return. He wants us to be godly in our ethics, to make every effort to live godly lives while we wait for God to come in judgment at Jesus' return. And since eschatology drives ethics, Peter starts with the issue of Christian eschatology in verses 5 to 10. And then in verses 11 to 18, Uh, He deals with the issue of Christian ethics. Uh, This talk and the next one are going to deal with the eschatology of chapter 3. And then our final, our fourth and final talk will deal with the ethics. So first, the eschatology in verses 5 to 10, and in particular, we'll look at verses 5 to 7 just now. Uh, Peter deals with the question of eschatology in verses 5 to 10 in two parts. And that's because the scoffers have two parts to their skepticism. Uh, Look again at verse 4 with me. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. They start with a question, where is the promise of his coming? And then they provide a reason 
behind the question. For, because ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So we have a question and a reason behind the question. Now Peter delays answering their question, where is the promise of his coming, until verses 8 to 10. That will be our next talk. He first critiques the reason behind their question in verses 5 to 7. The reason behind their question is, for ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. This is what Peter deals with in verses 5 to 7. Then in verses 8 to 10, he will answer the question, where is the promise of His coming? So let's look at the reason behind the question. The ancestors or fathers here in verse 4b are most like the Old Test are most likely the Old Testament patriarchs and prophets who spoke of God's coming judgment. Uh, but since their deaths, nothing has changed. Uh, God had not appeared in judgment as the Old Testament prophets said He would. Uh, now, uh, so we mustn't think that their argument. Uh, or we mustn't think that the argument of the scoffers and skeptics is a scientific one, trying to prove that the world is indestructible. Uh, the skeptics of Peter's day and the skeptics of our day know that there are such things as earthquakes that disrupt the regularity of the natural world. The Stoics and Epicureans of Peter's day believe that the world would eventually be consumed by fire and uh, the cycle of life begin all over again. Uh, just like skeptics today know of earthquakes and climate change, and uh, most scientists believe that the earth will eventually be consumed by an ever-expanding sun. So the issue is not the indestructibility of the world. That's not what the scoffers are getting at here. It's not a scientific argument. Rather, the scoffers of Peter's day were skeptical about God coming to judge the world, and especially the Christian belief that He was going to do that in His Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 4a, where is the promise of His coming? This is what is at the heart of all true skepticism against Christianity. God does not and cannot intervene in the world. The heart of skepticism is not really a scientific argument. It's an anti-supernaturalistic argument. Or to put it another way, all science is really just anti-God. All non-Christian science is just anti-God. The thing that skeptics despise, the thing they mock, is divine intervention in the world. I mean, just think about when comedians, stand-up comedians, mock the Bible. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube, Ricky Gervais, the British comedian. Uh, he's got a stand-up comedy where he just mocks Genesis chapter 1. He just starts reading through Genesis 1, mocking it as he goes. Uh, he mocks Noah's flood. He mocks Jesus walking on water. Why is he mocking those particular things in the Bible? Because they involve divine intervention in the world. They presuppose supernaturalism which is what he finds so unbelievable, so laughable. And that is what is at the heart of all true skepticism, an anti-supernaturalistic agenda. Now the question is, how do we answer this anti-supernaturalistic agenda, which the skeptics have here? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. It is a naturalistic worldview that they have here. God does not intervene in history. So how do we answer such skeptics, or how do we face such skepticism? Where in the Bible should we turn to, to engage the skeptics, to argue our case that God is coming again in judgment at Jesus' return? Well, I think if we're honest, there are certain parts of the Bible that we tend to avoid, or that we're told to avoid at all costs in our apologetics on tricky subjects, because uh, we don't want to complicate matters even more. I think there are a number of topics that uh, we're encouraged to uh, um, avoid or that we're slightly embarrassed about. Uh, angels, creation, the flood, and Sodom and Gomorrah. 
the fire from heaven that destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Cans of worms. Don't go there. Angels, too mystical, too mythical for a reasonable person to believe. Creation, did God really create everything from nothing and by speaking? Uh, was it 6,000 years ago or 6.4 million or billion years ago? Are those six ordinary days or six indefinite periods of time? Uh, the flood, the fable about the boat won't float with the skeptics. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, isn't that God uh, bringing down hell fire judgment on the LGBTQ community? Don't open the cans of worms. Don't give the skeptics more fuel for the fire of their skepticism. Don't add to the doubts of doubting Christians. Stay on topic. Just talk to them about Jesus. That's how we tend to think, isn't it? But where does Peter go <clears throat> in this letter when he is confronted with skepticism about God's coming judgment at Jesus' return? Where does he go? Angels, creation, flood, Sodom, and Gomorrah. In chapter 2, in order to prove that God's condemnation of false teachers is not asleep, Peter recalls God's judgment on angels, verse 4. God's judgment on the ancient world of Noah's time in the flood, verse 5. God's judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, verses 6 and 7. Peter's argument is that if God acted in judgment on the ungodly angels and people in the past, then he will act in judgment on false teachers in the future. God's condemnation is not sleeping. In chapter 3, he uses a similar kind of argument, only this time for a different purpose, to prove God's coming judgment on the whole world. Remember, the skeptics ask, where is the promise of God coming in judgment? And the reason behind their question is because God has not in intervened up until now in the world. Even though the Old Testament prophets said he would, everything is just going on the same since the beginning of creation. So why should we think he's coming in judgment in the future? And Peter responds to their reasoning with two points. And again, this, these pick up the theme of remembrance that we saw from the first uh, talk. Number one, remember God's powerful word in creation and the flood. Remember God's powerful word in creation and the flood, verses 5 to 6. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Uh, note, the word, note the adverb deliberately in verse 5. The skeptics are not ignorant of what they're doing when they reason the way they do. They know exactly what they're doing. Uh, it's like Richard Dawkins. He knows exactly what he's doing when he says that Je Jesus didn't rise from the dead because it's not possible for people to rise from the dead. He's deliberately forgotten, deliberately forgotten, the one piece of historical evidence that contradicts his premise. His premise is that people don't rise from the dead, which leads to his conclusion, therefore, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. The premise proves the conclusion because the premise excludes the one exception of someone rising from the dead, Jesus Christ. And that's like these skeptics. They assert that everything has remained the same since the beginning of creation. That's their premise. And so they conclude that God isn't coming in judgment on the world in the future. No divine intervention in the past, therefore no divine intervention in the future. But the only problem is they've deliberately forgotten the one historical fact that contradicts their premise. They have deliberately excluded it. And that fact is that God acted in the past by water and His Word on two occasions. Their premise only proves their conclusion because they've excluded the two exceptions that go against their premise, namely creation and the flood. Both occasions when God intervened in the world. 
And Peter says they argue this way deliberately. They're being sneaky. They're deliberately excluding these historical facts. Just like Richard Dawkins deliberately ignores Jesus' resurrection when he claims people can't rise from the dead. And how does Peter confront the deliberate forgetfulness of skeptics? By stating the facts of creation and the flood. The description of God's act of creation in verse 5, out of water <clears throat> and by water, uh, recalls the creation account when God created the earth by separating and gathering the waters. In Genesis 1-6, he separated waters by placing a sky between them. The original creation had waters on the earth and waters above the sky. Uh, chapter 1, verse 9, God gathered the waters together in one place <clears throat> and uh, formed the dry ground. So water was his material agent in forming the earth, in creating the world that we have today. <clears throat> but it wasn't the only agent at work. Uh, the waters were separated below and above the sky by God's word. He spoke and the waters separated. Uh, the waters were gathered on the earth to produce the dry land by God's word. He spoke and the waters gathered together. In other words, there was a double agency at work, water and word. But the primary agent was God's word. God's word moved the waters. And that is how the earth was formed, supernaturally. God was no deist. He didn't just wind up the world like a clock and leave it ticking uh, after the so-called Big Bang. No, God created the world out of nothing and then began to form and fill his world with special acts of creation by his word and spirit. He remained intimately involved in his creation but not just at creation, but also at the flood, verse 6. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. The phrase, by these waters, is better translated by these. That is, by means of water and the word. The world that existed was flooded and perished. In other words, the same two agents were at work in destroying the ancient world of Noah that were also involved in creating the world in the first place, water and the Word of God. We read in Genesis 7:11 when the floodwaters came, uh, the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of heaven were opened. That is, the waters that were separated above the sky at creation came crashing down. And the rains came down and the floods came up as we sing in Sunday school. Why? Because God had spoken. Genesis 6, 17. For behold, I will bring flood waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. God's word moved the waters. That is how the earth was destroyed in the past. Supernaturally. It wasn't a case of Mother Nature having a bad mood swing. It was a case of the Father of Nature stepping into his world in judgment. The flood came about by the divine intervention of God's powerful word. So let me just recap Peter's argument up to this point. The skeptics say that God isn't coming in judgment because there has never been any divine intervention in the world since the beginning of creation. So why should there be in the future? And Peter responds, Oh, but there has been divine intervention in the world in the past. Remember God's powerful word in creation and the flood. Skeptics deliberately forget the facts. Peter reminds us of the facts. That's the first point. Remember God's powerful word in creation and the flood. Second, so be assured of God's powerful word in the coming judgment. Verse 7, so be assured of God's powerful word in the coming judgment. Remember God's powerful word in creation and the flood, and so be assured of God's powerful word in the coming judgment. Verse 7, by, but by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. 
<clears throat> now notice Peter's logic with how verse 7 links with uh, verses 5 to 6. If God stepped in once to create the world out of water by his word, if he stepped in a second time to destroy the world with water <clears throat> by his word, then he can step in a third time to destroy the world with fire by his word. It's the same word, it's the same world, it's just a different agent. Fire, not water. In other words, what God did in the past by his word on the whole creation, he can do in the future on the whole of creation by that same word. God has not broken his promise. He will keep his word. How do we know? Remember God's powerful word in creation and the flood. So be assured of God's powerful word in the coming judgment. That's Peter's response to the reasoning behind the skeptic's question in verse 4. Their question, where is the promise of his coming, of God coming in judgment at Jesus' return? Where is the promise? Their reasoning, everything has continued as it always has since the beginning of creation. They're challenging the word of God's promise. Peter's response, they deliberately forget the facts. Remember God's powerful word in creation and the flood. So be assured of God's powerful word in the coming judgment. Now, I want to take a step back and apply this to modern skepticism for a moment. B.B. Uh, Warfield, the uh, great Princeton theologian from the early 20th century, once said, Christianity is unembarrassed supernaturalism. Christianity is unembarrassed supernaturalism. The adjective is important, unembarrassed. Christianity is unembarrassed supernaturalism. How many of us, if we're honest, get a wee bit embarrassed when some supernatural aspect of the Bible story gets brought up at work or on the street with our neighbors or at college, something like Noah's flood or Jesus walking on water. You know the kind of things that our secular world pokes fun at? They giggle at it. They mock it. How do you feel when those things come up? If we're honest, we feel a wee bit embarrassed, don't we? Well, the Apostle Peter is not embarrassed in any way. He's an unembarrassed supernaturalist. In this letter, he says that he saw Jesus transfigured into his future glory on a mountain where his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. And he heard the voice of the living God speak from heaven. In chapter 1, verse 21, Peter says he believes in the divine inspiration of Scripture where men were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote. In chapter 2, verse 11, he speaks of the existence of angels. In chapter 2, 4, he speaks of bad angels who were cast into hell. In chapter 2, 5, he says the world was destroyed by water in a flood and only eight people were saved in a boat. Yes, the apostle Peter believed in Noah's flood. In chapter 2, verse 6, he says, Fire and sulfur came down from heaven and burnt the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ash. In chapter 2, 16, he says that there was a speaking donkey in the Old Testament. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 5, he says, God formed the earth out of water by speaking. He says he flooded the world with water by speaking. Verse 7, he says God is going to destroy the world with fire by speaking. Peter is an unembarrassed supernaturalist. And that is how he argues when he's faced with skepticism. He doesn't ignore the can of worms issues. He doesn't concede ground to the skeptics by acknowledging they have some good points in their argument. Instead, he confronts the skepticism of his age head on with unembarrassed supernaturalism. Because that is what Christianity is. It's unembarrassed supernaturalism. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, the uh, founder of Labrie and also the founder of uh, 
the International Presbyterian Church in the UK, uh, where I'm ordained. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, uh, when he was invited to do university missions, would do them on one condition, and that is that the first talk he would give on the university campus would be on angels, on angels. Why? Because Schaefer wanted to confront the skeptics of secular humanism and the materialists and naturalists of secular science with this one fact, that if they wanted to believe in Christianity, then they needed to believe in supernaturalism. And what better place to start than with angels? That's why if I ever get to go back into ministry as a pastor, which I hope so one day, uh, I would preach one sermon a year at Christmas on angels and invite as many pagans as possible. Think about what Peter, uh, sorry, think about what Schaefer was doing. In effect, he was saying, if you want to believe in Jesus Christ, you need to believe in angels. That's how supernatural Christianity's, Christianity is. If you deny the existence of angels, then you can't be a Christian. Just think about where angels appear in the gospel accounts of Jesus' life. They appear just after his conception, uh, at his birth, at his temptations in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, at his death on the curtains of the temple that are torn in two, um, at his resurrection they appear, at his ascension. And he said that he was coming again in power and glory with angels. Angels attend every significant moment of the Christian gospel. If you want to believe in Jesus, then you need to believe in angels. You need to believe in supernaturalism, in God's divine intervention in the world. And what Schaefer was doing was using a supernatural element in the Bible, angels, to introduce people to the supernaturalism of Christianity, which is Christ, the God-man. And Peter does the same here. He uses God's supernatural intervention in creation and the flood to convince people of God's supernatural coming uh, judgment by fire. If you want to believe in God's coming judgment at Jesus' return, you need to believe in a special divine creation by His Word and a cataclysmic divine flood by His Word because it's the same Word operating in all three divine interventions in history. Just as you can't have Jesus without angels, you can't have God's coming judgment without creation and the flood. It's why our Bible plot lines, if they don't mention the flood, are seriously deficient. Uh, for Peter, the Bible plot line is not creation, fall, redemption, new creation. For Peter, the Bible plot line is creation, fall, flood, redemption creation. Now the question is, what kind of a flood was it? It's amazing reading a number of evangelical commentators and how they handle this passage in uh, 2 Peter. Michael Green, Dick Lucas, Chris Green, uh, all British men, some of whom I know, uh, all go for a local, regional flood. Well, if we read Genesis 7, 19 to 23, I think we need to ask ourselves how we would ever come up with a local regional flood when it says that the waters covered the tops of all the mountains under all the heavens. The double use of all is hard to get around. But more importantly, think about why Peter chose the flood in verse 6 as his second uh, example to illustrate the point he's making. He could have chosen another example of judgment by water and His Word in the Old Testament. Uh, he could have chosen God's judgment on Pharaoh and his army at the Red Sea by which God judged them by water and His Word. He could have chosen God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, which came about by fire and His Word. Why did Peter choose the flood? and not those other examples at this point in his epistle. Why the flood? Because it was the only Old Testament example available to him of a universal judgment. See, that's what he's getting at here. He's talking about the future judgment of the world that's universal. 
and the only example available to him in the Old Testament of such a universal judgment is the flood, the judgment at the Red Sea, the judgment at Sodom and Gomorrah. They're all local judgments. They're all regional judgments. Replace the judgment of the flood in Peter's argument with the judgment of water at the Red Sea or the judgment of fire at Sodom and Gomorrah and just see what it does to Peter's argument here in chapter 3. You can just hear the skeptics say, oh, okay, okay, for the sake of argument, let's say that God did actually judge Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea by water in his word, but the water never touched the Amorites. And so, going by your analogy, maybe God, when he comes in judgment, will judge some people but not others. Maybe he'll touch those people over there but not us. Do you see the problem? A judgment on a small scale that get, then gets applied to a larger scale doesn't work. Peter's argument only works because creation, flood, coming judgment have the same divine agent, God's word, and the same universal reference, God's world. What's more, the flood is a decreation, recreation event that patterns the creation of the whole world in Genesis 1. And as we'll see next week, uh, sorry, in our next talk, uh, the coming fire is a decreation, recreation of the world. Just think about what happens after this coming fire. There is a new heavens and a new earth, universal scope. And that's why the flood is the only suitable Old Testament type of the universal judgment to come. Because it was a decreation, recreation event for the whole world. So 2 Peter, uh, chapter 3, verse 6, I think assumes a universal flood, not a local or a regional one, which brings me back to the quote by B.B. Warfield. Christianity is unembarrassed supernaturalism. And this is what the church of Jesus Christ needs to recover. An unembarrassed confidence in the unembarrassed supernaturalism of Christianity. If the evangelical church and the reformed church in America is going to have any impact on the world as we face increasing pressure and questions from our skeptical culture, then we need to recover our theological nerve. We need to grow a backbone. We need to recover an unembarrassed supernaturalism to our Christianity, and one that begins not with the supernaturalism associated with Jesus Christ, but following the example of Peter. Peter, we need to begin with the supernaturalism that begins at creation and the flood. What does Peter do as he writes to Christians facing skepticism about God's coming judgment at Jesus' return? He shows them the certainty of God's coming judgment is dependent on God's prior intervention in the world at creation and the flood. Peter exemplifies an unembarrassed supernaturalism when it comes to his eschatology. And why? Because he knows that eschatology drives ethics. Remember what 2 Peter is all about? Ethics by eschatology. We're going to get to the ethics in our fourth and final talk where Peter will exhort us to live a certain kind of life. But in order to get there, we first have to establish a robust, unembarrassed eschatology. God is coming again in judgment with fire on the whole world. How do we know that? Remember God's powerful word at creation and in the flood. Let us pray. Father, uh, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us. And what we are not, please make us for the sake of your Son, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever praised. Amen.